Beryl's going to read the lesson for us. We have two readings this morning. The first one is in the Old Testament from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And our New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Beryl. Now Emma's going to come and, and preach to us. So Emma. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I was preparing a completely different talk for today, um, and I hope you don't mind, but it's a subject rather than a, a passage that I'm looking at. Um, and about three days ago, I frustrated Stephen mightily by saying, I'm really sorry, but I think God wants to say something else. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, it's fine. I've only changed it three times by. <laughs> but he's very gracious. So, the blessing of <laughs> rest, that's what we're looking at today. Sabbath. Anybody keep the Sabbath completely? No? Excellent. Good. So... At the start of the six weeks holidays for a lot of people, um, I thought it's a good time to talk about rest and what we do and what the point of it is. And in the Bible, there's a weekly enforced rest called the Sabbath. So we've just um, seen an Exodus verse about it. Um, Sabbath is something that God began to speak to me about a few years ago, and I've been studying it since then. So I've read countless books, studied lots of verses about it, prayed about it, practiced it to a certain degree and it's taken that long really to see a change of mind and a change of heart a change of actions because it's the undoing of 45 years uh, of thinking in a different way and i finally think it's time to perhaps share some of these thoughts and see what you think about it what god might be speaking to us about today so before i start talking holy spirit i just pray that you would come you would be with us lord you would open up the scriptures you would illuminate them that you would open our hearts to hear you. I pray for no condemnation, just freedom, joy, and peace in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's look at it from the Old Testament until now and see what the Bible says, because it doesn't matter what I think, it's what the Bible says, isn't it? So we've just had the Old Testament verse, the Exodus 20. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. The Sabbath day that the Bible talks about was a Saturday. Most of you probably know that's the day that the Jews celebrate the Sabbath. But did you know that the Jews consider a day from the interval between sunset to sunset? So I always think of it as you wake up, that's the start of your day, and until you go to bed, that's the end of the day. But they've always celebrated it from sunset to sunset. And I only really thought about this concept recently, how God created the day to begin at sunset. So we're supposed to start the day with rest. And when we wake up, we are working from rest. We begin with rest. In our culture, we do this totally the opposite way around. We work, work, work and work until we collapse and have to rest reluctantly from our work. But God's priority for us was to teach us to rest and work from a place of restedness. You know, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, forbade man to do any work on the Sabbath and it was punishable by death. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, cooking a meal or loading the dishwasher or hoovering or cleaning up endless puddles of water from your toddler is classed as work and it's punishable by death. That's how seriously God took it. And how he wants us to take, not how he wants us to take it, how seriously he wanted his people to take uh, the concept of Sabbath rest. 
Now, there are two main Hebrew words used for rest in the Bible. The first one is Shabbat, which gets partially trans- translated into our word Sabbath. And it means basically stop working. Dead simple, isn't it? The idea that you do a job, you come home, you clock off, job's done, no more work till you clock back in. Doesn't quite work so well if you work from home, like I do. There doesn't seem to ever be a clocking off. It's, you're always at work. But the concept is you work and then you stop working, Shabbat. The other main Hebrew word for rest used in the Hebrew scriptures is nuach. And this means to dwell or to settle. And it's like a, a type of rest that you can imagine sitting in front of a log fire, snuggling in a blanket with a book, which is probably my favourite thing to do. It's that kind of restedness, being restfully present. And the first instance of Shabbat in the Bible is right at the beginning of Genesis 2, verse 15. It says, by the seventh day, God finished The work he'd been doing and he rested from work. He blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And then a few verses later, we read that God creates man and woman and then allows them to experience Nuak, that dwelling with God himself in the Garden of Eden. He rests them or he settles them into the garden. And it seems as though to me the two concepts work together. You you west west from (laughs) you rest from work and we rest with God. And that kind of sums up really how I see a Sabbath is, you know, resting, not just playing PlayStation all day or doing something random, but actually spending a bit more time with God and having that communion with him. Now, unfortunately, as we know, that pattern didn't last very long as God's people began to be rebellious and look to other gods and do other things. They turned away from God's good plans for them in every way possible. But God still chose to rest with his people through the tabernacle and then later in the temple, There's still this intention of the first original Sabbath of God resting with his people. I'm just reading through Exodus at the moment and they've just built the tabernacle and the Lord has just rested in the tabernacle in the form of a cloud. And it was just that powerful image. Everything was perfect and God just came and rested. And while he was there, the people stayed and dwelt in that place. And when the Lord moved away, then they followed him to the next place. It was was quite, quite a powerful passage really. So what does a Sabbath look like by the time we get to the New Testament? Well, the early Christians continued to follow the law, so they continued to keep the Sabbath on a Saturday. But then, because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday, some of the new believers started to regard their Sunday as a Sabbath. They called it the Lord's Day. And that's why we continue to meet on a Sunday instead of a Saturday. Did Jesus and his disciples observe the Sabbath? Well, they kind of did, didn't they? But then they also didn't do it in a religious, um, legalistic way. And in fact, Jesus has a lot to say about the Sabbath and the true rest that God intends for his people. In the second verse is that um, Bella read to us, Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, when I read that verse, I kind of feel rested just reading it. Just how rich that is. You know, the disciples and the Jews have been following legalistically this, you must rest. And it had become, instead of a lightness, instead of something that's pleasurable to do, it had become a wearisome, a heavy burden. It's a a something that had to be kept with all its rules and regulations. It It wasn't a nice thing anymore. And immediately after this passage in Matthew, we get quite a a sequence of stories telling of Jesus and his disciples seeming to break the Sabbath. And the Pharisees kind of waiting for him to do it and setting him up to fail, going, let's see what he does now. Let's see see if he breaks the Sabbath. We're going to get him. Because it was such a big thing for them. Is it coincidence? No, I don't think for one minute it's accidental. Jesus says, come to me who all you who are weary and heavy burdened and then you see him kind of breaking the sabbath by healing people and picking corns corns ears of corn jesus is pointing out to the jews they've missed the point of the sabbath they've missed the point jesus didn't create the sabbath as a stick to beat them with it was to express how very important it is for us to rest both from work and to rest in fellowship with father god The people were in need of rest, both in ceasing from hard work, the Shabbat, and being present with God, Nuak. And Jesus redefined the Sabbath to show them it was possible 
without it being legalistic. So what about today? There are many, 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 many laws in the Old Testament, aren't they? And they were summed up and brought together by just two. Jesus says, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And I want you to love your neighbour as yourself. So does this mean that we disregard all the Old Testament laws? I think my rule of thumb is that if it's taught after Jesus has been resurrected, then it's still important for us to do it. So there's two instances in the New Testament that Sabbath are mentioned. Number one is Colossians 2.16 and it says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. And the other one is Hebrews 4 verse 1 where it says, Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So what does this say to you? As far as I'm concerned, it fits into the category of all the other laws. The spirit of the law is still there, but the legalistic weight of it has been replaced by an invitation. So under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit hasn't been given to all the believers, so they're receiving teaching passed down by the priest. They're literally following a list of rules because they're told to. Today, we are invited to enter into the rest of God. We've got no less need to rest from physical work than there was in the Old Covenant. God still desires to rest, and indeed he says it's necessary, it's really important. The same applies to us spending spiritual rest and time with the <clears> Lord. But if you, if you notice that as soon as we make something a thing, something that we have to do, it becomes a heavy weight, it becomes a yoke, it becomes a heavy burden. It becomes something <clears> to break. And Jesus knew this about us and about our rebellious nature. So let's reimagine Sabbath under the new covenant. Why don't we have a day of rest? You know, what is stopping us? We've got a culture of, of busyness and hurry sickness. How are you doing? Oh, I'm really busy. What have you been doing this week? Oh, I've been really busy. Most people are attached to devices 24-7, available by email and text 24 hours a day. What on tap? TV and films in our hands. We've got distractions everywhere we look. The culture of work is to work all hours, day, night, weekends, meeting deadlines, to make more money, to be successful. And it's like our modern culture has removed us so far away from nature and the natural rhythms and cycles in our bodies that we just, we have, there's an epidemic, isn't there, of sleep deprivation. People can't sleep anymore. We're slaves to work. We're slaves to a relentless consumption of media. You know, I'm not standing here going, oh, I just rest in the trees all day long. You know, my life is, is hectic, it's busy. I'm up at 6am, I run a business, I have a toddler, I do two teenagers, I cook every meal from scratch, and I also have a desire to read and do hobbies and actually live a little bit as well. And my day is just passing a flash. And sometimes all I seem to do is follow Charlotte around, tidying up after her and picking up things and cleaning up puddles of water and mess. Um, and there doesn't seem to be time to fit everything in. So when it gets to a Sunday, you're looking around and you're going, oh no, I didn't do the dishwasher yesterday and there's loads of sand all over the house and I need to hoover it up and there's this to do and there's that to do and then, and then there's this kind of quiet voice saying, but it's, it's time to rest. You know, the housework police are not coming around today to check your house is tidy. <clears throat> it doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter really. If the sand's still there tomorrow. I am genuinely too busy to have a day off or even half a day off, but God who made me and who knows me and who made the world says it's absolutely crucial to have one day off a week where I'm not working. And if I decide to ignore him, I'm being proud and saying that I know better than God. And there are consequences to ignoring God in this. So what are the consequences of not resting? Physical burnout, mental burnout as well, to be honest illness, stress and anxiety, exhaustion, pushing God to the corners of my life. I added a few more last night, poor health, short temper, being a shouty parent, swearing. <laughs> you know, you don't get enough sleep and you don't get enough rest. It's really hard to cope. So the last two weeks have been so hot, I've struggled to sleep massively. And every day I've felt myself being just a little bit more short tempered and a little bit less patient and a little bit less able to cope because I'm not getting enough sleep. 
oh, weight gain, add an extra little bullet point on the other page. You know, there's so much now in uh, everything that I'm reading about um, weight loss, you have to have enough sleep. Now, obviously, that doesn't apply to anybody in this room. It was just for me. Um, but, yeah, when we're trying to lose weight and be healthy, we've got to have enough sleep. Between seven and eight hours of sleep. You know, we're created, aren't we, to run out of steam and to get tired and to need to be replenished, to be refreshed, to be restored through rest and sleep. And if we ignore this and we end up on enforced rest, because our bodies give up, don't they? And they go, right, bed rest for you. <laughs> Burning the candle at both ends is bad. So, what is stopping us take a day off? For me, it's just seeing a list of things that need doing, the never-ending housework. But at the end of the day, you know, that just amounts to pride, doesn't it? It's saying that I'm not fully trusting you, Lord. The world's not going to fall apart if I rest. The housework police aren't coming. And it's challenging that total reliance we have on ourselves to keep our lives running. And it's putting our lives back in God's hands and saying, OK, you know, you know best. Most of the books that I've read about Sabbath are pushing for that legalistic, you know, do absolutely nothing, don't look in the mirror, don't brush your hair, don't cook a meal, don't hoover, don't wash up. And, and that's fine if you feel like that's what God is saying to you. There's no problem in doing that. But then you have to put into effect the Colossians passage which says don't judge other people who aren't going to go to that extreme as well. It's kind of between you and God, isn't it? But I think the only way to truly have a day off is be organised. So prepare your meals the day before, put them in the fridge ready to nuke in the microwave, have paper plates so you don't need to wash them up. That's an extreme, isn't it? Doing the dishwasher with the hoovering and stuff the day before, enlisting the help of the whole family to get stuff done so that your day is a collective day of rest. Originally I thought, you know what, we can do this. Scott can have one day off and I'll have the next day off and the kids can have a day off. The kids are always off, aren't they, let's be mm -hmm. honest. They'd they don't really help with the house anyway. <laughs> but according to the Exodus passage, you can't do that. You all have to be off, even your slaves. You have to give your slaves the same day off. So that's not going to work out. It's a day of collective rest and worship. So that's what I was aiming for. But honestly, have you ever tried to do it? Just to have a day where you literally don't lift a finger to do anything work-related. It's almost impossible and then you kind of do something and feel really guilty and think, I've failed, I might as well hoover. But you know, God doesn't condemn us when we try something and it doesn't work. You just keep going, you just go, actually, no, I'm not going to hoover, I'm going to read a book, or I'm going to go for a walk, or I'm going to do something. And I've found it's actually much more achievable if you practice Sabbath from sundown to sundown, particularly if it's a Sunday and people have got school and work the next day so you can prepare stuff for the next day. Sabbath rest at the end of the day, is a heart attitude. It's a ignore the mess, ignore what needs to be done, and just spend time. So what am I allowed to do? That's a good question, isn't it? That's kind of what I was asking. Come on, tell me, what am I allowed to do then if, if I'm doing a Sabbath? Am I allowed to do baking or gardening or painting? I would say, you know, it depends what you consider to be work. So if gardening is work to you, don't do it. But if you find it restful, and you find it relaxing, and you find it draws you closer to God, then get out in the garden. Cooking and baking might be a chore for you. For me, I love it. I love it, I find it restful, I like listening to an audio book while I'm doing it, and I just find that that restores my soul. The essence of Sabbath is bringing together those two elements, rest from work and rest with God. So how do you connect best with God? Is it reading, praying, walking in the country, listening to music, spending time with family or friends? When I was preparing the talk on Thursday, uh, Phil texted me and my brother and he said, do you fancy going for a walk tomorrow? And I kind of, I just sat there and I went, I said, what's the matter? I said, I'm just thinking, do I have time <laughs> to go for a walk? Because I've got so much to do. Mm. So I texted him back and went, yeah, okay, let's do it. And so we went out first thing in the morning and, and spent all morning at this beautiful place in Darwin. And it was just the best thing I could have done because I'd felt myself getting more and more wound up and stressed and impatient and when I came back I felt like a different person just getting out into nature and just spending time in the countryside in the forest in the trees it was just beautiful this week as I was preparing this talk I was sat in the front room and the tv was on and there was noise there was people there was stuff going on I just put my headphones in listen to some worship 
And again, it was just, it was like Susanna Wesley with her apron over her head praying in the corner. It just felt like I was in my own little place and I felt refreshed and restored. It was restful to me. You know, we've been in lockdown, haven't we, for a long time, it feels like. And it's not been restful for everybody. It's not been restful for me. But there's been a lot of people who found themselves with lots of time on their hands and not a lot else to do. Was this perhaps an opportunity to practice the Sabbath rest? To spend time with the Lord, studying, praying, sleeping, doing those things you've not had time to do before? And it seemed to me, particularly in the early days of lockdown, when the whole world had stopped and the traffic wasn't there and there was no flights, it was like God gave us a glimpse of his rest and even the world rested and began to heal. It was a precious insight as to how crazy things had become and how God invites us, not orders us, but extends an invitation to come away with him, to lie beside still waters, to rest our bodies and our minds, to be refreshed and restored. Perhaps you didn't accept that invitation back then, but every week we've got another opportunity. Will we take it? The difference in the new cust cu customer covenant <laughs> I'm doing well out of my talking today, do you think? Not making any mistakes at all. The difference in the new covenant is we don't do things out of fear of punishment, out of legalistic actions, or out of religion. Therefore, it doesn't matter what day we choose to rest, or even that we do the same day every week, or that we split it over two days. God wants us to do it with an open heart, a generosity. Sabbath brings my relationship with God back to the forefront of my life. It reminds me I'm fully reliant on him. It reminds me that he is first in my life, that everything else will fall into place. You know, seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added unto you. Everything else will fall into place. You know, on those days where I've stopped and I've given time to God, the next day when I wake up, everything's still there, but I've got more energy to do it and more gusto to do it. Work six days, then one day a week, don't. It's not rocket science, is it? It was revolutionary back then. And I wonder if properly understood, God's great gift of the Sabbath might be revolutionary for us today. And I'm going to finish with this here. It's called Resting is Doing. It has been going on Facebook this week, and I saw it again last night, and I thought, well, isn't that good timing? So this isn't from the Bible, but this is just worldly wisdom that just happens to tie in with what God wants to say to us today. So I'm going to finish with this. You don't need to be busy. You don't need to justify your existence in terms of productivity. Rest is an essential part of survival, an essential part of us, an essential part of being who we are. When a dog lies in the sun, I imagine it does it without guilt, because as far as I can tell, dogs seem more in tune with their own needs. As I grow older, I think that resting might actually be the main point of life. To sit down passively inside or outside and merely absorb things, the tick of a clock, a cloud passing by, the distant hum of traffic, a bird singing, can feel like an end in itself. It can actually feel and be more meaningful than a lot of stuff we are conditioned to see as productive. Just as we need pauses between notes for music to sound good, and just as we need punctuation in a sentence for it to be coherent, we should see rest and reflection, and even sitting on the settee, as an intrinsic and essential part of life that is needed for the whole to make sense. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you'd help us today to spend time resting in you, to being restored in our body, in our mind, in our soul as we spend time thinking about you, perhaps reading your word, perhaps praying, perhaps just being in your beautiful creation, Lord. Help us to get that rhythm of life, of rest, of sleep, of work, in the right order. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.